Good evening. Welcome to Reykjavik University. I am Björn Þór Jónsson. I'm the Dean of the School of Computer Science here. Uh, we are all very pleased to have Dr. Richard Stallman with us here tonight. Uh, he is the founder of the Free Software Foundation. He's the author of a number of tools that I have used heavily in my research, such as uh, Emacs, GCC, and GDB. And he's the author of the GNU General Public License. Uh, Dr. Stallman, I would like to welcome you on behalf of Reykjavik University and the uh, Free Software Foundation chapter of Iceland. Uh, we're, of course, here to hear your talk. So uh, without further ado, I give you the floor. Welcome. This, the reason people started inviting me to give talks is my work on free software. But this talk is not about free software. This talk responds to a question that people frequently asked me at the end of talks about free software. They asked, do these ideas apply to anything other than software? So uh, in order for it to make sense, I had better start by briefly telling you the ideas of free software. But first, a couple of requests. If you take photos of me, please do not put them in Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is a surveillance engine. It surveils its users. It surveils the people who are not its users. If you put the photo of someone in Facebook, you give Facebook another opportunity to collect information about that person. We could dispute whether putting photos of your friends in Facebook is a decent way to treat your friends. But that doesn't affect me. What does affect me is whether you put photos of me there. Please don't. Second, if you record this talk and you want to distribute copies, please, only in the formats that are favorable to free software. That means the AUG formats and WebM, not in MP whatever it is, not in Flash, not in Real Player, Windows Media Player, or QuickTime. And since this is a statement of my opinions, please put the Creative Commons No Derivatives license on it. <clears throat> so what is free software? Free software uh, is software that respects your freedom and your community. So it would be free owls. It, it, it's free as in freedom, not as in price. So think of free speech, not free beer. <clears throat> when a program is not free, we call it proprietary, non-free, user-subjugating software, because a non-free program is an instrument of unjust power. The owner uses the program to subjugate users. This should not exist. <clears throat> With software, there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. The first case we call free software, because in order for the users to have control over the program, they need certain freedoms, and those freedoms are the criterion for free software. There are four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program does your computing the way you wish. These two freedoms give you individual control over the program. Individual control means each user separately has control over what that program does for her. But individual control is not enough. For, for one thing, most users don't know how to program. They don't know how to exercise freedom one. Individual control alone doesn't do much for them. But even for a programmer like me, individual control is not enough. If you're a programmer, then you're busy doing a few jobs, and you don't have time to study the source code of thousands of programs that you use, or to write all the changes you might wish, not personally. That's more work than one person can do. 
So we need collective control too. Collective control means any group of users are free to work together to control a version that they use. For this, we need two additional freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to redistribute exact copies to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to distribute modified versions to others when you wish. These freedoms make it possible for a group of users to work together, changing the program to do what they together want it to do. So with, free, with all four freedoms, we have both individual control and collective control. You can participate in a group and that exercises collective control when you wish, but you can also change their version yourself, exercising individual control on top of the group's collective control. <clears throat> However, when the users don't have all four freedoms, then they don't fully control the program, which means the program controls them. And the owner controls the program and through it exercises power over its users. This is why a non-free program generates a system of unjust power. <clears throat> and what do these owners do to the users? Well, they put in malicious features features that spy on the users, restrict the users. There are even back doors to attack the users. Basically, <clears throat> with a non-free program, the owner has power over the users, and the owner knows it. They are fully aware nowadays of what that power implies, which means that they feel temptation to abuse it in various ways. And if the owner is a corporation, meaning a psychopath, corporations are psychopaths by their structure, uh, what's it going to do when it, it feels a temptation? It gives in, of course. What else would it do? It wouldn't even hesitate. <clears throat> so you find malicious features all over the place in proprietary software. There are spy features. There are features to restrict the user, and there are back doors. Microsoft Windows has all three. And the back door is a universal back door. They can remotely install software changes. So any malicious feature that's not in Windows today could be installed tomorrow remotely without asking the owner of the computer for permission. <clears throat> Mac OS is malware too. It has digital handcuffs. Digital handcuffs or digital restrictions management are the features to restrict what users can do with the data they have in their computers. The software in the iThings, the latest monsters from Apple, <clears throat> has all, all three, spy features, digital handcuffs, and a backdoor. Flash Player has a surveillance feature and digital handcuffs. So Flash Player is malware too. <clears throat> Angry Birds has a surveillance feature. That's its real purpose, to collect information about the users. It collects their locations and sends that sooner or later to home base. <clears throat> the Amazon Swindle Amazon's ebook reader swindles readers out of the, tr the traditional freedoms of readers through malicious features in software and in other ways. And most portable phones have surveillance features and a universal backdoor with which they can remotely install software changes. And these have been used to convert phones into listening devices. And they can listen to you from across the room. You don't have to talk into the microphone for Big Brother to hear you. <clears throat> so this is what happens when some owner controls the program. The only defense against this is for the users to control the program. 
if you use a non-free, uh, sorry, if you use a free program and you're not a programmer, you're probably not the only user. There are other users, and some of them do know how to program, and they sometimes look at the source code and because they want to add a feature or fix a bug, but in the process of understanding the source code, they also see if it's malicious. And if they find a malicious feature, they can fix it and release a corrected version, and most people will switch to that. <clears throat> so this is a defense. It's not perfect, but it's better than being defenseless. The user of a non-free program is totally at the mercy of its owner. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I started the free software movement in 1983 by announcing my plan to develop a complete free software operating system, meaning every piece of the system will be free software. Because if any piece is proprietary, it takes away your freedom, and that means it's no good. It's got to be 100% free software, not just 99% free software. <clears throat> so I started developing GNU in January 1984. The last missing piece was the kernel Linux, which was freed in February 1992. And that filled the last gap in the GNU system, making the combination GNU plus Linux. So that's when we first had a complete free operating system we could use. Of course, there have been a lot of things to add to the system since then. So uh, after we started having pieces of GNU that people were using, like the programs that were mentioned in the introduction <clears throat> and others, people started asking me to give more speeches about free software. And I would explain these ideas in greater depth and length. And people would ask sometimes at the end, well, do these ideas apply to anything else? Like, what about hardware? Should hardware be free? Well, in this context, what would it mean for hardware to be free, for physical objects to be free? It would mean that they would carry the same four freedoms. So does that make sense? Well, freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. That would be the freedom to use the physical object as you wish. Well, normally with a physical object, you get that freedom. Manufacturers that sell you physical objects, they don't put on licenses telling you how you can or can't use them. No, you own them. You can use them any way you like. Now, there are certain things you're not allowed to do, but that has nothing to do with using a particular object. Like, you know, fraud is illegal, but a pen doesn't come with a license saying you may not use this pen to commit fraud. There's a law against fraud. It doesn't matter whether you use this pen or a pencil or uh, write something in the sand with your finger or use a computer, it's still fraud. But it has nothing to do with the manufacturer of the, of the pen. It's not up to the manufacturer to decide whether fraud is illegal. It's a, t it's a different kind of thing from a license restriction. So, <clears throat> Generally, you have freedom zero with physical objects. What about freedom one, the freedom to study and change the source code to make the program do what you wish? Well, physical objects generally don't have source code. So we have to adapt this freedom somewhat. It could be the freedom to study and change the object. And generally, you have that freedom. You know, if you bought this microphone, you'd be free to change it. But it's not easy to do. You know, this is made of metal and maybe some plastic. It's not easy to change objects made out of those things. Now, a wooden object is easier to change. A wooden chair, you can actually do some things to that might be useful. But with metal, it gets harder. With plastic, even harder. A chip is impossible to change. If you tried, you would just destroy it. And this is not anybody's 
not due to anybody's malice. It's just the nature of chips that they are that way, not anybody's fault. So <clears throat> what about freedom too, the freedom to copy it and distribute the copies? Well, there are no copiers for most physical objects. In science fiction, we speculate about them, but they don't exist uh, except for keys. And what about freedom three, the freedom to copy and distribute your modified versions? Well, if you manage to, to modify the object, which sometimes you can do, there are still no copiers. So basically what we find for physical objects is you've got freedom zero, you've got freedom one, but there are practical constraints on exercising it, and freedoms two and three don't make any sense at all. So basically, we don't have a problem today about making no physical objects non-free. However, there are some things for which this question is meaningful, things that you can copy and you can change, namely published works. If you have a copy of a work in your computer, you can use your computer to, to copy it and distribute copies and to change it. So the question of whether you're allowed to do that is a meaningful question with real effects on our lives. And that's the question this talk is really about. It's getting hot in here. Is there any chance of letting in some air? The air outside is cool enough, I think. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what should we be free to do with our copies of various works? Now, for the most part, if you have a copy of some work and it's not software, the only thing that restricts what you can do with it is copyright law. So we can formulate the same question from the other side by saying, what should copyright law say about the works that we have copies of? <clears throat> now, to look at this question, it's useful first to look at the history of copyright law and the history of copying, because copyright law developed with copying technology. <clears throat> now, Changes in technology do not alter our basic principles because our basic principles are too deep to be reached by superficial things like technology. But when we apply our principles to a specific question, we do it by looking at the various things we might do and what their consequences would be, and we judge those consequences. Now, changes in technology can alter the consequences of the same act. So they can make the act become more good or more bad than it was before in the past. For instance, if we could reliably resurrect the dead, murder wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> the judge would say, you killed him, you will pay for his new body, bang. <clears throat> Now, in the United States, we would all need to get uninsured killer insurance, but in civilized countries, the National Health Service would take care of it. <laughs> so let's look at the history of copying technology and copyright. Copying began in the ancient world. It was done by reading one copy and writing another. Now, this was slow, inefficient technology, but it had certain other interesting characteristics. First of all, it had no economy of scale. To make 10 copies would take you 10 times as long as making one copy. Second, it required no skills other than the skill of reading and writing.
Third, it required no equipment other than the equipment for reading and writing. The result was a decentralized system of, cop of making copies. Wherever there was somebody who had a copy and wanted to make another, he would. There was nothing like copyright in the ancient world. In the ancient world, if you had a copy and you wanted to make another, nobody tried to stop you. Except in the case where the local potentate didn't like that book. In that case, he might do horrible things to you, but that wasn't copyright, that was censorship. Of course, they've been closely related ever since the beginning of copyright. It's the copyright and censorship have gone together. <clears throat> and they still often do. Well, it went along that way for thousands of years, but then there was a great advance in copying technology, the printing press, which made copying more efficient, but not in a uniform way. In the ancient world, we had mass production copying and one at a time copying equally slow. With the printing press, we got this. Mass production copying got a lot more efficient, but one-off copying did not benefit at all. In fact, it was faster to do that by writing another copy than by using a printing press. Because with the printing press, it takes a lot of time to, put, to set the type, but then you can quickly make many identical copies. So, the printing press had an economy of scale. It was cheap to use the printing press to make many copies and quite expensive to use it to make one copy. Secondly, it involved expensive special purpose equipment. The press and the type were expensive things that most literate people did not have. And they also didn't know how to use them because using a printing press is a different skill from reading and writing. <clears throat> the result was a centralized system of production of copies. Copies of any given book were made in a few places and then they were transported to where someone might want to buy them. Copyright began in the age of the printing press. The present system of copyright goes back to England, where copyright was started in 1557, I think, as a system of censorship. Anyone that wanted to publish a book had to ask the state for permission. This permission was granted, if it was granted, in the form of a perpetual monopoly for that one publisher. However, in the 1680s, the censorship was no longer desired and, and the system was allowed to lapse. The publishers then demanded their monopoly back. But what, they, what was established in the Statute of Anne <clears throat> in the 1700-something was somewhat different. It was a monopoly lasting, I believe, 14 years for the author instead of the publisher. And it could be renewed once if the author was still alive. And thus the idea developed that copyright would be a scheme for encouraging writing. When the United States Constitution was written, there was a proposal that authors should be entitled to a copyright. This was rejected. Instead, what the US Constitution says is that Congress can optionally establish a copyright system. If it does, the purpose of the system, the stated explicit purpose, is to promote progress. In other words, a benefit for the public, not for the author. And the copyright has to last a limited time. Of course, the copyright lobby doesn't like these restrictions and wants to get rid of them or wants us to forget them. 
But copyright in the age of the printing press functioned as an industrial regulation, regulating publishers controlled by authors, but the system was designed to provide benefits to the general public. As a result, it was mostly uncontroversial, easy to enforce, and arguably beneficial for a society. It was mostly uncontroversial because it didn't restrict the readers. It restricted publishers. So if you were not a publisher, you had nothing to object to. So people didn't object much. It was easy to enforce because it only had to be enforced against publishers. And it's easy to see who's publishing a book. You go to a bookstore and you look at their copies and you say, where do these come from? And therefore, it didn't require invading everybody's home, everybody's computer, and everybody's internet connection. And it was arguably beneficial for the general public and for society because theoretically, the public traded away certain parts of its natural rights that were useless to the public because ordinary people were not in a position to exercise them. And in exchange for these useless natural rights, they got real benefits of more books being written. <clears throat> so if we were still in the age of the printing press, I wouldn't be giving a speech criticizing copyright law. But the age of the printing press is gradually giving way to the age of the computer networks, another advance in copying technology that once again makes copying more efficient in a non-uniform way. Here's what we had in the age of the printing press. Mass production copying pretty efficient and gradually getting more so, and one-off copying as slow as it ever was. With digital technology, we get this. So mass production copying is still a little more efficient than one-off copying, but not much more. The difference is much smaller now. The big improvement is in one-off copying. So this brings us to a situation more like the ancient world, except that everything is more efficient. The result is to change completely the effect of copyright law. Even if the words of copyright law were exactly the same now, its effect would be diametrically opposed. <clears throat> because now they try to apply copyright to the readers too, to the users of works, not just to publishers. They wanted to restrict everyone. And the w even the way the laws were written it would it restrict everyone if we use computer networks for what they're capable of doing. The result is copyright law is no longer an industrial regulation on publishers controlled by authors <laughs> to give benefits to the public. It's now a restriction on the general public controlled by the publishers principally in the name of the authors. This means that the reasons we used to consider it good no longer are, re are no longer relevant. We're dealing with a completely different social phenomenon. And because copyright law is being applied to the readers, it's no longer uncontroversial, it's no longer easy to enforce, and it's no longer beneficial. It's no longer uncontroversial because now they're trying to restrict everyone, and everyone doesn't like this, and people are starting political parties to fight against it. It's no longer easy to enforce, because it's no longer being enforced only against publishers. Now it's being enforced against everyone, and that requires invading people's homes, computers, and internet connections. And it's no longer beneficial, because the part of our natural rights, which in the past we didn't mind trading away or having the government trade away for us because we couldn't use it anyway, now we can exercise those natural rights 
and we want to. And therefore, we want the government to br bring us back the rights of ours that we naturally deserved that they traded away. So <clears throat> what a democratic government would do is bring us back the parts of these natural rights that we really need. They would, it would reduce copyright power. We can measure the sickness of democracy around the world by the tendency of governments to do the exact opposite. They're extending copyright power as never before. First, there's a dimension of time. We've seen a wave of copyright term extension going around the world. The European Union recently extended the copyright term on sound recordings. I don't remember the precise details, but it was a big extension. And uh, a few decades ago, they extended it from, uh, they extended the term of copyright on, uh, on textual works for, it used to be till 50 years after the author's death and they extended it to 70 years. <clears throat> and then the United States did the same thing in 1998 with the Mickey Mouse Copyright Act, as we generally call it, uh, which extended copyright by 20 years for all works, both past and future. Now, keep in mind that under the US Constitution, the only legitimate grounds for such a law is to, in, is to encourage making more works. How can they encourage the making of more works in the past by extending copyright on past works? They'd need a time machine. And if they have a time machine, strangely, they haven't used it. Our history books don't record that in 1920-something when artists discovered that they would get 20 more years of copyright given to them in 1998 that they set to work with renewed vigor. <laughs> Why don't they use their time machine and get us more beloved classics? Extending copyright on future works could conceivably convince people to put more effort into future works. But only if they're, only if they're irrational. And contrary to the myth, most artists are fairly rational. And they would understand that the discounted present value of 20 more years of copyright starting 50 years after you're dead is so small that it's not enough to affect any rational decision about what to do now. <clears throat> no, these were, these were just the bullshit excuses. The real reason for the law was companies had valuable monopolies that were scheduled to expire. Well, they didn't want those monopolies to expire, so they paid for an extension. In the US Congress, laws are for sale. So Disney, for instance, realized that the monopoly on the image of Mickey Mouse, the copyright on the image of Mickey Mouse, would expire. And then other people would be able to use that image inside their works, other graphic works. Well, since Disney has obtained tremendous value from the public domain, it knows how important the public domain is and is firmly determined never to contribute anything to it. So Disney paid to extend the monopoly on the image of Mickey Mouse, and maybe other companies paid too, and they got what they wanted. But that only was 20 years, which means in 2018, they're going to be back in the same situation again, and they're going to try to extend it some more. The movie companies have already admitted that they want perpetual copyright, but that would require changing the US Constitution, and they're not powerful enough to do that, at least not yet. So they have to pretend 
to, that they're not doing it. So instead of legislating perpetual copyright all at once, they add 20 years and then they'll add another 20 years and another. Every 20 years they'll add 20 more years and this way no copyright would ever expire again unless we manage to stop them sooner or later. <clears throat> but the worst case that I know of <clears throat> is in Mexico. In Mexico, copyright lasts for a hundred years after the author's death. So if the author died before you were born, the copyright might last until the end of your life. You'll never see those works in the public domain. But even more important is the dimension of breadth. <clears throat> Which uses of a copyrighted work does copyright cover? In the age of the printing press, those were the exceptions. There was a broader space of all the uses you could make of a, of a work. And initially, those were all things you could freely do. And then copyright cut out an exception of things that you're not allowed to do. But that was not the whole space. Just part of the things you could do with the work were covered by copyright. And there were still some things you could freely do. However, the publishers see in digital technology the opportunity to seize total control, control over all uses of published works. They aim to implement this, to impose on us a pay-per-view universe through malicious behaviors in our technology, namely digital handcuffs or digital restrictions management. <clears throat> through non-free software, they convert our technology into our jailers. And it's always done in non-free software. And the reason is their goal is to exercise power over the users. And it's only non-free software that gives them such power. If they put restrictive features into free software, the users would fix it. They would make a modified version that, was, that didn't restrict people, and everyone would switch to that. You can't restrict people by res respecting their freedom. You only restrict people by taking away their freedom. So taking away our freedom is what they always do. <clears throat> the public saw, uh, outside of the narrow area of computer games, and it was pretty narrow in the 1980s, the public first encountered digital restrictions management in DVDs. The video, DVDs are designed so that the video can be encrypted in a format that was secret. And the DVD conspiracy said, if you want to make DVD players, you have to join the conspiracy, which means you promise to keep the format secret and to build your DVD players to restrict the public just like all the other DVD players. This is why they all have the same restrictions. They're all nasty. For a while, that worked. But then people figured out the format and released a free program to decrypt the video in a DVD. For the first time, it was possible to buy a DVD and watch it with free software. However, it was also possible to copy it. The publishers didn't like that. So <clears throat> they started purchasing laws to censor that software. Starting in the US in 1998, they obtained a law banning the distribution of programs that could break digital handcuffs. Effectively, the US government took the side of the publishers against the public, against the people. <clears throat> However, it wasn't limited to the US. The European Union adopted a directive like that in 2002, I think, uh, 
so it's very important not to join the European Union. <clears throat> and the United States has imposed similar unjust laws on other countries through its free exploitation treaties. For instance, New Zealand, Colombia, ha and others have unjust laws like these dictated to them by the United States. <clears throat> so <clears throat> they liked these laws, but people kept on distributing the programs anyway. They're easy to find. So they developed a different scheme for encrypting videos called AACS. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's, what's, that's one thing that's used in Blu-ray discs. And they thought it would never be broken, but people did break it. There's a free program that decrypts the video of Blu-ray discs. <clears throat> the problem is that they arranged to change the key from time to time. And, uh, well, every so often people re find a key and release it, but you can't read all Blu-ray discs that way. And some of them have another layer of digital handcuffs, which they change every three months. And I don't see how the free world is ever going to be able to get enough resources to keep up with that. It's another task of reverse engineering every three months. You've got to regard Blu-ray discs as designed to attack you. They're your enemy. You should never use any product that was designed to attack your freedom unless you personally have available the means necessary to break the handcuffs. <clears throat> and things are getting even worse. Nowadays, there are services that distribute video over the internet using secret encrypted formats. And what makes that so bad is they could change the format in a minute. So it's almost useless to figure out a way to break the handcuffs. As soon as they see that the public has a way to break the handcuffs, they'll put in a different kind of handcuffs. So we have to reject those services. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we've also seen digital handcuffs on music. That started some 10 years ago. We saw discs that looked like compact discs, but they were not written according to the standard or the specs for compact discs. So we called them corrupt discs. They were CDs, but they weren't proper compact discs. And the reason that they wrote them strangely was to try to stop them from reading into a computer. So people made lists of these to boycott them. <clears throat> Sony came up with a clever idea for how to make corrupt discs. Instead of writing the tracks in a squiggly way that the computer wouldn't read, they wrote the tracks in the normal standard way, but they put a program on the disc <clears throat> so that if you put the disc into a computer, the program would run, and it would take control of the system and then it would alter the system. And it did several things. It, uh, it put in code to restrict the use of data from these disks. It also changed the command that you would use to investigate what was in the system so that it would not show the presence of this software installed into the system. It changed the code you would use to delete this code from the system so that it would not really delete this code. If this starts sounding like a virus to you, that's no coincidence. <laughs> <clears throat> this is what viruses do. It's, this code is called a rootkit. And this is what viruses and other kinds of malicious uh, schemes to take over a computer do. And this is a felony. They could have gone to jail for years for this. But this was not the only felony. Uh, 
some of the code in this rootkit was copied out of a program that had been released under the GNU General Public License. Now, the GNU General Public License is one among many free software licenses. You may have heard that this is the only license that's free software. That's false. There are a bunch of others. Look at gnu.org slash licenses slash license list dot html. You'll see uh, dozens of licenses that are free and a bunch more that are not free. But in any case, the GNU GPL is unusual. It's, what's special about it is it's a copyleft license. It says, if you copy some of this code and put it in another program, that program has to be released under the GNU GPL2. So you have to pass along the same freedoms that you got. Well, Sony didn't do that. That was copyright infringement. It was commercial copyright infringement. And thanks to a law purchased in 1996 by Sony and other such companies, that's a felony too. <laughs> of course, Sony was never prosecuted because government officials in the US understand that the purpose of these laws is to maintain the power of companies like Sony over the people. However, the victims of this scheme sued Sony. But instead of focusing their condemnation on the evil purpose of what Sony was doing, they focused it on the evil means that were used. In other words, on the secondary wrongs. Therefore, Sony was able to settle the suit with them by promising that they would never, that in the future when they design products to restrict people's freedom, they wouldn't use these methods. And Sony learned its lesson because then it came out with the PlayStation 3 in which the rootkit was installed before they sold the product and was designed to be impossible to remove. And it was AACS, the, which I told you about. And then somebody figured out a way to bypass that. And at that point, they forced all the users to choose between giving up one half of the functionality and giving up the other half of the functionality. When they sold it, they said, you can either use our system and get access to our network of games, or you can install some other system. But at that point, they said, you've got to give up. If, if you install this firmware upgrade, you'll only be able to talk to the network of games. You won't be able to run the other system anymore. And if you don't install this firmware, I should call it a downgrade, then you won't be able to talk to the network of games anymore. So it was lose one half of the functionality of the product you, that you bought it for or lose the other half. Now, is that swindling or what? Uh, and then somebody found a way to jailbreak the machine and they sent the police after him. Which is the point at which we called for a complete boycott of Sony, which is still in effect. Don't buy anything from Sony. <clears throat> Meanwhile, <clears throat> DRM and music mostly disappeared. The record companies found that their contract with Apple was screwing them. Apple was selling the music with DRM. But the, so they, they tried distributing it without DRM, and the sky didn't fall, so they basically got rid of DRM on music. But it's coming back with music screaming services like Spotify. <clears throat> They require the use of a non-free client program. And why? For DRM. Because the most obvious feature to add would be to save this piece in a file on disk. But they don't want that feature to be there. So they make you use, so they send the music in a secret encrypted format that makes you use this non-free program, which is designed to restrict you by not offering this feature. And they want people to think that somehow because it's streaming you couldn't have this feature. That's ridiculous. Of course you could. They just don't want to. 
and they don't want to be blamed for their own decision, so they try to pretend it's not a decision. <clears throat> We've also seen DRM in books. Around 2000 or so, we saw a worldwide PR campaign to convince us that we were all going to love ebooks. And a year or two later, the publishers started selling ebook readers and ebooks, and the ebooks were encrypted for the sake of digital handcuffs. And one publisher had the idea that it could get its line of digital ebooks selling with a bang to technophiles by starting with a biography of me. So they sent an author to ask for my cooperation, and I said, only if this book is sold without the encryption, and people are free to share it, and they can read it without this non-free software. The publisher rejected that, and so the plan was torpedoed. However, a few months later, we found another publisher who wanted to publish the book on paper and was happy to agree and also published it on the text online under the GNU free documentation license, meaning with the four freedoms. And uh, they sold it for a few years and then they stopped and now the Free Software Foundation sells the second edition revised by me. So it's my semi-autobiography. It has my point of view in contrast to Sam Williams' point of view. I don't know if there's any other semi-autobiography like this. <clears throat> so look at fsf.org if you want to find that. Anyway, ebooks failed 10 years ago. People just didn't like them. It would have been nice to believe that people rejected them because they valued their freedom and were unwilling to give it up, but I realized that was not why. It was some practical convenience reason. So I said, they will try again. We have not defeated them. We've only driven them off. And they tried again with products like the, uh, the Sony Shredder and the Barnes & Noble Schnook and the Amazon Swindle that are all designed to take away readers' freedom. <clears throat> the Swindle in particular swindles readers of the traditional freedoms that readers used to enjoy. For instance, there's the freedom to acquire a book anonymously, paying cash, perhaps. Impossible with the swindle. Amazon won't accept cash. Amazon requires the users to identify themselves. So Amazon maintains a giant list of all the books each user has read. The existence of such a list threatens human rights. We cannot tolerate the existence of such a list anywhere. Then there's the freedom to give the book to someone else after you read it, or to lend it to various friends after you read it, or to sell it to a used bookstore after you read it. Amazon abolishes these freedoms with digital handcuffs together with end user license agreements that say that the user doesn't really own the book at all and never did. The user only has a license to read the book under Amazon's choice of conditions. So this shows that Amazon does not respect private property. Amazon's idea of private property is everything belongs to us, which is not private property. <clears throat> and then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish, which Amazon abolishes with a back door. We know about this back door by observation. In 2009, Amazon <clears throat> remotely erased thousands of copies of a particular book. Copies that until that day, we're authorized 
They had been obtained by the users directly from Amazon in the approved manner. And then one day, Amazon deleted them all in an Orwellian act. And the book that was deleted was 1984 by George Orwell. <laughs> the book that gave us the phrase, Big Brother is watching you, that, pre that presented a totalitarian state whose crimes began with burning the books it didn't like and got worse from there. There was a lot of criticism of Amazon, so Amazon said it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state, which, if you've read 1984, is not very comforting. <clears throat> but when, in what circumstances might Amazon be ordered by the state to remotely delete your books? Several years ago, I launched a boycott of Harry Potter products. After the author got an injunction in Canada ordering the people who had bought her book not to read it, literally. That's what the court said. The people who had bought the book were ordered not to read the book. How did this happen? What led up to this? Well. She is desperate for every last million she can get. So she worked out a, a precisely designed marketing plan of building up publicity, and at a certain moment, the books were supposed to be on sale. But there was an error. And in one bookstore, the books were put on sale before the intended date. People walked into the bookstore. They saw the books on display and said, I'll buy this one. And so they, they bought it and went away. And then somebody noticed it was a mistake and took the books off of sale. But people had already bought the book and gone away, and the people in the store didn't know who they were. Well, this riled Ms. Rowling no end, and she got this order from the court telling those people not to read her book. I found that so disgusting that I called on people not to, to boycott these books. But I don't say that, they sh that you shouldn't read the Harry Potter books. I leave that to the author and the publisher. I only say you shouldn't buy them. <laughs> and more generally, you shouldn't, pu you shouldn't spend any money towards Harry Potter stuff. If you want to read the books, well, borrow it from the library or read someone else's copy, et cetera. Could someone possibly get me some water? Thank you. So here's a situation where, they, where the court might order Amazon to delete books. Right? They couldn't, they couldn't go and to the houses of the people who had bought those books and take the books away from them, because they didn't know who those people were. But with the swindle, they would know. And so in a similar situation, the order would say, remotely delete those people's books, because they weren't supposed to be able to have these books. So there is a real danger. <clears throat> even if the state doesn't become totalitarian in the 1984 style, it might order books remotely deleted as a precaution, never keep books in anything that allows such a backdoor. And you should not identify yourself when you get books either. If you don't want armed men coming to your house to take the books away from you, You should all read 1984, but clearly not in the swindle. <laughs> the official name of that product is Kindle. Kindle means to start a fire. Apparently, a suggestion that the real purpose of this product is virtual book burning. <laughs> <clears throat> so in 
So <clears throat> in all different forms of media, we see these attempts to turn our technology against us into our enemy, into our prison guard. So we have to reject digital handcuffs unless we know how to break them. But this kind of individual pushback is not enough because companies organize to foist these DRM schemes on us. It's not done by one company at a time, generally. It's done by a conspiracy of companies working together to restrict the public's access to technology. And how do I know this? Because these conspiracies are not secret. They know that our governments are on their side against us, and they don't bother to hide the conspiracies. These conspiracies have websites where they state what their policies are. I told you about AACS, the video encryption scheme. Well, I looked at its website once. To s someone told me about a certain point in its rules. It said that as of a certain year, it was either 2011 or 2013, I can't remember which, analog video outputs would be forbidden. So that shows how much power they believe they have, and maybe they really do. Now, a conspiracy of companies to restrict the public's access to technology ought to be a grave crime, just like a conspiracy to fix prices. After all, attacking us in our freedom is even worse than attacking our wallets. It should be punished more severely. But it's not a crime at all. Our government is on their side. So we have to unite and organize to push back. So the Free Software Foundation started the Defective by Design campaign, which you can find at defectivebydesign.org. It's a campaign of protests against DRM. So please go to that site and sign up to participate in our protests. We need to have lots of participants. We need to show these companies that they will be hated for attacking our freedom. So this is what non-democratic governments are encouraging around the world. But what would a democratic government do? Well, it would reduce copyright power so as to return to the general public the freedoms that are vital. Specifically what? First of all, there's the dimension of time. Copyright lasts far too long. We need to shorten it. I recommend that copyright last for 10 years, starting with the date of publication of the work. Why from the date of publication? Because until the work is published, we don't have copies of it. So it doesn't really matter whether we could copy those copies if we don't have them. Uh, we might as well let the author have 10 years, ha have as long as it takes to arrange pop publication, and then start the clock for 10 years. But why 10 years? Well, the usual publication cycle is only three years. Within three years, most books are out of print. So 10 years is more than three times as long. That's comfortably longer. Very few books a, a tiny fraction of books are still in print after 10 years. Even successful books are not, most of them are not in print that long. So it should be plenty. But not everyone agrees with this suggestion. I once made these proposals in a panel discussion with fiction writers. And an award-winning fantasy writer at, on the panel said, 10 years, that's horrible, nothing more than five. I was surprised too. Until that moment, I had been fooled 
by the publishers. When the publishers demand increased power over us, they always say that they're doing it for the sake of those artists. But to make them sound even more important, they like to call them creators. Makes them sound sort of like deities. Uh, above us mere mortals and thus deserving of power over us. <laughs> but, and, and they typically bring out a few stars to say, yes, give me more power. And we're supposed to think that all artists think the same, but actually it's just the stars who feel that way. The other artists are being ground into the dust by the heels of those publishers. But we don't know about them and we don't hear from them. Except this time I heard from one. You see, his book contract said that if the publisher let the book go out of print, the rights would revert to him and he would be able to do other things with his book however he wished. Well. His fans were writing to him saying, how can I get a copy? The publisher won't sell me one. It, it appeared, practically speaking, that his book was out of print. But the publisher refused to acknowledge that the book was out of print and was using the copyright on his own book against him to stop him from distributing copies to his fans, which he wanted to do so they could read it. You see, Artists generally start out wanting people to appreciate their work. A few get tremendous amounts of money, like Ms. Rowling, and they become corrupted by, by this, and their main desire becomes to get as much money as possible. But most artists never get enough money to be corrupted by it, and they continue wishing for people to appreciate their work. He wanted people to appreciate his work. He was glad it got published. More people saw the work that way. But then he wanted to be able to distribute it to him. He realized that more than five years of copyright were unlikely to ever do him any good, but could easily do him harm. So he said, nothing more than five. Well, I'm not saying it has to be 10 years. I recommend 10 years as a first adjustment. And why do I suggest 10 instead of 5? I'm just trying to be less radical. <laughs> I'm not, I'm trying to go as far, I'm not trying to go as far as possible, only as far as necessary. I'm trying to propose a smaller change from the existing situation. But what about the dimension of breadth, which activity, which uses of a copyrighted work should be covered by and restricted by copyright. For this, I distinguish three broad categories of works. First, there are the works that you use to do practical jobs. Second, there are the works that present what certain people think. And third, there are artistic and entertainment works. So these three kinds of works contribute to society in different ways. And I'm not trying to compare the importance of one kind versus another. It's not a quantitative difference, it's a qualitative difference between the contributions, say, of works that you use to do jobs and works that you appreciate. So. First, let's consider the works that you use to do practical jobs. We can call them functional works, but this doesn't mean that they have no aesthetic characteristics. It just means that their aesthetics is secondary. What's primary is do they do a job that you want to do, and do they do it well? This category includes programs, recipes, educational works, reference works, text fonts, patterns for 3D printers to make useful, that is not just decorative objects, and other things as well. These works must be free. And I mean the same four freedoms. Why? Freedom is having control of your own life. If you do a job using a work, you need to have control of the work in order to have control of the job. 
And for the users to have control over work, they need the four freedoms. Just as, just as in software, it's the same for the other works that you use to do practical jobs. So, <clears throat> so all these works need to be free. But what about the second category, the works that present certain people's thoughts and their views or their, what they say they saw, their testimony? Well, these works don't need to be free because you don't use them to do a practical job. You use them to see what certain people thought. To publish a modified version of one of these works is to misrepresent somebody else unless he gave you permission. And if he says that's accurate, that represents him accurately, well, OK, then your modified version is useful, but then you're getting permission. So you don't, we don't need to reduce copyright power for that. So for these works, there's no reason why we should legalize publishing a modified version without getting permission. That means we also have no reason to legalize commercial use without permission. So I propose somewhat, a, a somewhat reduced copyright system, which would cover all commercial use of these works and all modified versions. But there's one activity which has to be legalized, and that's sharing. Sharing means non-commercially redistributing exact copies. That has to be legal. So there's commercial and non-commercial. All the commercial use would be still covered by copyright. There's exact copies and modified versions. All modified versions would be covered by copyright. But non-commercial redistribution of exact copies, sharing, should be legalized. That must be legal for all published works. And the reason is what makes copyright intolerable today is the war on sharing. Sharing is good. And with digital technology, sharing is easy. So people share. But the publishers don't want us to share. So how can they stop people? What c if something is good and easy, how could they stop people from doing it? only through nasty, draconian, cruel measures. So they propose a series of one nasty, draconian, cruel measure after another. They st started with digital handcuffs, turning our technology into our enemy. But then they started suing teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then they started uh, th then they started punishing people f on the mere accusation of sharing. That is, abolishing the basic principle of justice, no punishment without a fair trial. In the UK, they punish people for being accused of sharing, and there's no trial. Trials are uh, irrelevant. Proof that someone's guilty, irrelevant. This is a matter of maintaining an unjust empire's power. Justice is irrelevant. <clears throat> the US doesn't have a law like this. Instead, it has an unofficial arrangement between the major ISPs and the major publishers. And when the major publishers complain enough times to the ISP, the ISP will informally punish its own customers. They've promised to do that. Obama arranged this scheme, showing what he thinks of Americans. And the US has imposed similar unjust laws on other countries, such as Colombia although it's now being reconsidered there in the Supreme Court. <clears throat> anyway, uh, they didn't stop there. In Japan, downloading one copy of something without authorization is punished by two years imprisonment. 
And if that turns out not to be enough, I guess they'll start sending drones to shoot rockets at people who share. <laughs> <clears throat> Two of Obama's favorite characteristics put together. <clears throat> so, this is intolerable. And it's not just that the, they happen to have chosen nasty, unacceptable measures. It's no coincidence. The reason these measures are nasty is because they're trying to do something wrong. We must legalize sharing including sharing on the internet, including peer-to-peer -peer sharing. <clears throat> but what about the third category, artistic and entertainment works? For these, the issue of modification was difficult because I see valid arguments on both sides. On the one hand, a work of art can have an artistic integrity and modifying it could destroy that integrity. Now, it's a fact that most authors willingly allow Hollywood to butcher their work in exchange for, no for enough money. But there are some who refuse. And I guess those authors have real artistic integrity. But on the other hand, modifying an artistic work can be a contribution to art. It doesn't misrepresent someone if you say, this is my work of art. It's, it's different from that. Well, it can be a contribution to art. Consider, for instance, the folk process by which a series of artists can transform a work and they can produce something very rich. But then, if we want to consider only named authors, consider Shakespeare. Some of Shakespeare's plays used stories that were copied from other works that were published a few decades before. Of course, the, whole, the work as a whole was not a copy. Uh, it, was, it was modified. It was implemented differently, you might say. But the story was copied. And if today's copyright law had been in effect then, that would have been forbidden. And of course, those works would never have been written. And so the copyright holders would have said, copyright's doing a good job. It's preventing Shakespeare from making these cheap ripoffs of my work. Well, if the works, if Shakespeare had never written those works, we might have had no reason to disbelieve that claim. But since those works were written, we can say that they were significant contributions to human literature. But eventually I realized that although a modified version of an artistic work can be a contribution to art, it's not a desperate hurry. If copyright only lasts 10 years, you could wait if necessary for the, work to go, for the previous work to go into the public domain when its copyright expires, and then you can publish a modified version. So that's what I propose for 10 years this somewhat reduced copyright system, which covers all commercial use and all modification, but sharing is legal. And then the work goes into the public domain and you can publish modified versions. But there is another issue, and that is remix. Remix means taking pieces of various works and putting them together in a, a work that's fundamentally different from any of those. It's not a modified version of one of those works. It's too different. It's a completely different work. Well, remix has to be legal, because if anything justifies copyright, it's encouraging the making of new works. To interpret copyright in a way that blocks remix perverts it, turns it against its purpose. That can only happen when companies have taken control over the system and perverted it to suit their goals instead of the public's goals. So let's go back to the public's goals, and we've got a legalized remix. We also need to extend the US concept of fair use to other countries, except we, have to, we should make it even stronger than it is in the US. 
Fair use in the U.S. is a defense against accusations of copyright infringement. There are several factors to be considered, like how you're using the work, whether you've changed it, and, it, and what you're doing with it, and whether you're making money, and whether it replaces the work, various factors that get added up together to decide whether it counts as fair use. But <clears throat> that's, a, that's a very important exception. But it needs to be changed from a defense you can raise to an explicit exception, which will make it stronger, more something that people can count on more. <clears throat> Finally, we must not allow end user license agreements to restrict people even more than copyright restricts them. Because if copyright lets the reader have some rights remaining, these contracts can take them away and leave the readers with nothing. We've got to stop that. So we need to legalize sharing. The publishers will say the sky is falling, but of course they're exaggerating. The record companies will say, if you share, you're stealing from the musicians. This is bullshit. The record companies took everything from the musicians, leaving nothing we could take if we wanted to. If, when I buy a commercial CD, which is my main way of getting music, I'm ashamed because I know I'm not supporting the musicians. You see, according to the typical record contract, a certain fraction of the price is for the musicians, but they never get it because the production and publicity expenses are treated as an advance to those musicians. And so this fraction of the price that you pay goes to repay the so-called advance. It almost never happens that a record sells enough copies to finish repaying the advance and actually give some money to the musicians. A record can go platinum. Uh, somebody showed, wrote about a, a, a hypothetical scenario where, but, but that he says is typical of the music industry, where a record goes platinum and it still doesn't sell enough copies to f actually start giving the musicians anything. So how do musicians make money? From their concerts. They charge admission. They can sell fan gear. So what benefit do they get from their record contracts? Mainly publicity. If the record contracts lead to more appreciation of their music, they can have more concerts and charge more and more people will come. They can go to bigger places. That way they make some money. But the uh, hype industrial complex is not the only way to give musicians publicity. There are other ways we can do it, like mailing your friend, listen to this. So let's take the record company's money out of this. Now, I'm not against having companies that make records and sell them. I mean, I buy them. Why do I buy CDs? I won't get music over the internet because A, you're forced to identify yourself and I won't identify myself to get copies of works. And second, they impose end user licenses agreements. So you have fewer rights than you'd have if you got a CD. So I only get music on CDs and I would like to have more record stores selling more CDs. So I'm not against record companies for making and selling CDs, but the major record companies, the ones that lobbied for unjust laws and digital handcuffs, the ones that had their, their tentacles sue teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars, what those companies deserve is to be destroyed. They deserve the corporate death penalty. So let's give those companies what they deserve. Let's do away with them. <clears throat> uh, 
<clears throat> but there could be other record companies. And it might be nice if we could change copyright law so that they would really have to pay the musicians. What about music? Sorry, what about movies? You've heard astronomical sums for the cost of making movies. Could they still make movies with this change? Well, first of all, a producer told me that more than half of these figures is actually publicity, not making the movie. Making the movies less than half. And that amount was exaggerated already by clever accounting tricks. So the real cost is much less. Put that together with the fact that a lot of use of movies is commercial use and would still be covered by the, by the somewhat reduced copyright system I'm proposing, and I think that they could still make movies. Maybe they would have to do without some of the super expensive special effects for another five years until they get to be cheap. Uh, but what if they couldn't, what if Hollywood couldn't make movies? Would we lose anything? Hollywood systematically makes crap. I didn't say usually, although that's true also. I said systematically. There is a system at work. And the nature of that system is that it almost always produces crap. Now, that doesn't mean they shouldn't be allowed to make these movies. I'm against all forms of censorship. No matter how disgusting a work might be, censorship is more disgusting. But. The question here is not about censorship. No one's proposing that, least of all me. Rather, the question is whether we should give up freedom we need to help them keep making crap. I'm not willing to. However, <clears throat> even though this somewhat reduced copyright system would continue supporting artists in more or less the same inadequate way as now, we might want to support them better. We must reject the idea of compensating the rights holders. Because the rights holders, it's supposed to, you're supposed to think it's the artist, but really it's publishers. They're the ones who'll get the money. We, why, we shouldn't give them any more. And compensating, well, that presumes that somebody has lost something and we have to make, and it's our fault, so we have to make it up to him. Well, if you appreciate a copy of a work, that's no loss to anybody else, so there's nothing to be compensated. The word compensation is inappropriate. And so is remuneration. Remuneration is something you give in respect in return for doing work. If you hire some musicians to play at your party and you agree to pay them money for this, well, then you owe them money. You should pay them. But appreciating a song doesn't mean you owe any money to anybody. So, and it, it doesn't mean that you have, you ought to pay somebody in, that, that, you, that you are bound to pay somebody. So those terms, compensation and remuneration, must be rejected. Because those imply that appreciating a work gives you a debt of money that you have to pay. But it's good to support artists. So I propose two systems, two new additional ways we can that society can arrange to support artists. This is in addition to other things that people will keep doing, like selling copies. Why not? They can go on selling copies. I'm not proposing any change in that. Or charging admission to a concert. I'm not proposing any change in that. But I'm suggesting two additional ways we can support artists. One method uses public funds. The government would collect money, either just taking it out of the general budget or using taxes on internet connectivity or whatever might seem appropriate to get some money to distribute among artists. 
and it would distribute based on the popularity of each artist, which we could measure through a scheme of polling. There are various ways of doing this. But then how do you, once you have a, a popularity figure for each artist, how much money should that artist get? The obvious way is in linear proportion to popularity. So if you, people look at your works twice as much, you get twice as much money. This is a bad way to do it because it's easy for a star to be a lot more popular than another capable, fairly popular artist. A star could be a thousand, a star A could be a thousand times as popular as good and appreciated artist B. And with linear proportion, the star would get a thousand times as much money as B, which means almost all the money would go to the stars who don't really need any more. So the scheme would do little good for the arts, it would just give more of our money to stars. So I propose to take the cube root of the popularity of each artist and distribute the money in proportion to that. Well, the cube root looks like this. The cube root of 1,000 is 10. So if A is 1,000 times as popular as B, a would get 10 times as much money as B. Not 1,000 times, just 10 times. So the effect of the cube root is to transfer money from the stars to the artists of medium popularity. <clears throat> it still, each star would still get more than a non-star. It would remain the case that the more popular you are, the more you get. But it would taper off in such a way that most of the money goes to the large number of artists of medium popularity and the small number of stars would get in total only a small fraction of all this money. So th this change makes the system efficient for supporting the arts because it directs most of the money at the artists who really could use help. The other method I suggest involves voluntary payments. Suppose each device had a button you could push to send a certain sum of money to the artists. A fairly small sum, like in the US maybe half a dollar. I'm not sure what a good amount would be for Iceland, but I figure each country would fix this amount to try to maximize the total amount people send in any given period of time. If it were too little, a lot of people might send it, but it would add up to, to less. If it were too much, not very many people would send it. But so there should be a certain figure which maximizes the, the, the a total amount people will send. And you push the button and you send it if you feel like it. If you don't want to, you don't. Nobody punishes you or twists your arm. But there might be publicity suggesting that it, if you should, do, you should send some money to some artist because you'll feel good when you do. And it will feel good. Of course, so, if they pick the right amount of money, you might send this amount once a week or even once a day, and it wouldn't add up to so much that you couldn't afford it. Of course, there are some people who couldn't afford it. There are poor people who couldn't afford to send even a little, and they won't, and that's okay. We don't need to squeeze money out of poor people to support the arts. There are enough people who are not poor and who will, can afford to support the arts a little and will feel good when they do. So <clears throat> these are my proposals for additional ways to support artists. And I should point out that people, that voluntary payments are already working to support artists. A month ago, a bunch of well-known science fiction writers released the Humble eBook Bundle, a collection of eBooks with no DRM and no end-user license agreement, and they said, 
pay whatever amount you wish. You didn't have to pay. You could download it and not pay anything. But a lot of people paid. In fact, they got a million dollars in two weeks of voluntary payments. They said that this is a level of income that corresponds to the New York Times bestseller list. And it was entirely voluntary. And the more people are using the internet, the more it will work. The only problem with it is there's no way to pay anonymously. This, an this button has to send an anonymous payment, at least anonymous as regards who's paying it. It doesn't have to be anonymous for who's receiving it, but it has to be anonymous for who's paying it. Uh, there's no way to pay for the humble ebook bundle anonymously. I wrote to Cory Doctorow and said, would you please tell people how they can mail you money orders? And he said, uh, well, the volunteers who are taking care of this don't have time to handle that. It seems to me that if they got in a million dollars, maybe they could pay the people to, <laughs> to handle that part of things. It would only add up to a small fraction of it anyway. I want them to accept money orders because if I download it, I think I'll want to pay them, but I'll insist on paying anonymously. I can't do that over the internet, so I don't do e-commerce. Anyway, for more information about free software, <clears throat> you can see GNU.org. There is also FSF.org, the Free Software Foundation's website where you can see various resources and political campaigns <clears throat> and you can also join the Free Software Foundation. Please do join. We need your support. You can join through the website if you do e-commerce. You can also uh, pay me your dues in cash if you wish to join that way. <clears throat> but we need your support that way. We also need the help of volunteers. Now, many people assume that the help we need is programming. Well, we, there are a lot of programming tasks we'd like people to do. But what we need even more is political activism and organizing. You don't need to know how to write code in order to volunteer to help us. So if you want to help, let me know. Or take a look at gnu.org slash help for a list of various ways you can help us. So now it's time for questions. And I feel like sitting down. Uh, I'm. Is this, is this on? Yes, it is. I am somewhat hard of hearing. My difficulty is recognizing consonants. So when you speak to me, please speak loud and slowly and carefully pronounce each consonant so I can tell what your question is. And please be brief. Please don't start with apologies. Please don't start with praise. Just go straight to the point. <laughs> Can you tell us about your computer? Oh, this computer, this is a Lamote Elung, which I chose because even the BIOS is free. <laughs> now, they're not making them anymore, but I'm hoping that by next year there will be another model uh, that we could recommend. Now, one problem is when they sold these, they were sold with a non-free GNU slash Linux distro. So you had to replace that. I hope I can convince them to sell a model with an entirely free system so that the FSF can endorse it. But you know, that depends on them. I can't understand a word. OK, sorry. Uh, I work here at the library at Leiden University. And we, of course, have money problems buying licenses to use academic material. Do you have a solution for that? The solution is 
scholarly publications must be free. Now, I used to think that they only needed to be shareable, but Michael Eisen from the Public Library of Science said that uh, there are a lot of other things that need to be done with scientific papers other than just copy and redistribute them for the sake of science. So he's the expert on this, so he convinced me. And now I believe scientific publication must be free. Now, I think that universities should adopt a policy with no exceptions allowed, saying that any articles that their staff or, and faculty publish must allow free publication at most a year later. And this way, uh, this way they will put an end to the stranglehold that the academic publishers have. But you might want to go further and say, in this university, it has to allow free publication immediately. Why let those journal publishers keep any of their power? When they came to exist, they were necessary. Fifty years ago, the only way to disseminate scholarly writing was to publish it on paper, and those companies did it, and they didn't they did it the only way anyone could possibly have done it, so there was nothing to criticize. But now, the right way to distribute that literature is to put it on the net. And the journal publishers that continue to restrict availability and restrict the reuse of the articles that are published are basically uh, predatory dinosaurs. And we need to get rid of them. Uh, now, the other people refer to, in, don't use the term free publication. They, they talk about open access. I think that term is, is misleading because it focuses on the wrong thing. It focuses on access instead of what people are allowed to do with the publication. And the result is that the most important point that people should be allowed to redistribute and do various things with these articles gets forgotten and tends to get lost. So I don't use the term open access, I use the term free publication. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the only grounds for copyright under the U.S. Constitution was to promote the progress. Promote progress and promote artists producing new works. Yeah. Could it not be argued that by extending copyright, you push artists to create new works instead of rehashing old works or republishing? No. And the reason is that the kind of rehashing that they uh, would probably have done doesn't infringe copyright. I mean, if you're a professional, you know what, which aspects you could reuse and which, at what level you'd have to write it afresh. And you'll notice, in fact, that lots of use of old stories goes on in Hollywood. Uh, copyright doesn't prevent that. It may mean that's, that A is paying B, but it doesn't, doesn't stop them from doing that. that state yeah, so someone's point, point of view. Yeah. Judges would decide. Yeah, yeah. right? So what? I mean, this is the re so it doesn't matter. The reason for courts is to make distinctions. It's a mistake to aim for laws that have no distinctions and treat everything alike. Uh, because 
cases are different. We don't, we don't, it would not be justice to treat them alike. It would not be a wise policy to treat them alike. No, you wouldn't. It's not that hard to make it. It's pretty clear what the distinction means. No, I think you're just being unreasonably pessimistic. In any case, in any case, it would be wrong to treat these different categories the same way. We've got to treat each category in the way that is appropriate for it. To, to set up the goal of having laws that are totally uniform, it's a misguided goal. It means a badly written law, a law that, whose policies are not right for the various cases it has to deal with. Things in life are different, and we've got to recognize that they're different. To make simplicity be the highest priority means we have to make bad laws. What about software? You know, it takes time and money to make software. So what? <laughs> I mean, people that uh, companies have to have some incentive to. Uh, no, they don't. Why should we? Why should we give it an, a company an incentive to make proprietary software? Proprietary software is a trap that invites us to give up our freedom. It shouldn't exist at all. So uh, any policy that enables a company to profit by making proprietary software is a bad policy. We should make sure there is no proprietary software. Uh, uh, there is, uh, in Iceland, I think, uh, over 90% of the population is uh, part of uh, Facebook. Well, okay, these, these systems are not the same issue. Facebook is very bad. Twitter is not so bad. Okay, let's uh, Facebook. Uh, the contract situation there is because people are producing material put on the site. Uh, and there is a lot of people who are not producing material. Many things make Facebook bad, but principally surveillance. Look at stallman.org slash facebook.html for a list of bad things that Facebook does. <laughs> you want to pick people up? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, I can't hear you. <laughs> you talked a lot tonight uh, about corporations and companies uh, in the computer business that you don't trust. Are there any that you do? Well, actually, I'm mo they're mostly, I wouldn't call them the computer business. Mostly it's publishers I'm criticizing. Yeah, but um, I'm talking like Google, Facebook. Is there well, I didn't say anything about Google today. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> I'm asking if there are any of those, any corporations or companies in that business that you trust? Well, I mean, trust a company is not the question. The question is, what is the company doing and is it bad? So I'd rather look at the specific things a given company does and judge it as good or bad. What, what I'm interested in is really, uh, you, you're, you're talking about like the circumstances of the law, and you're saying that... Uh, I was talking about copyright law. Yeah, yeah but you're saying that uh, companies, are, you started your lecture by talking about how companies uh, listen. Proprietary software developers typically because they are aware that they have power over users typically mistreat those users yeah, exactly. but that's because of proprietary software you see proprietary software is a scheme that gives the company power over people that's where it's bad yeah. so there shouldn't be proprietary software and as long as there is we should be wise enough to refuse to have it yeah but is there any company that you know of, that makes proprietary software, but isn't exploiting it. I don't know. Do there's no way I could tell, right? Yeah, I yeah, presume yeah. there are some, but there's no way we can verify that about proprietary software. So, any, so I'm sure there are proprietary programs which don't have malicious features. They're still bad because they're proprietary.
Are you picking people? Yeah, or? They, they should have waited for a while. So. Okay, the point is, if you could, either you pick people or I pick people, but we can't do it both. <laughs> you do it. Sure. Uh, presidential elections. Your thoughts. In fact, I US. voted for Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate, <laughs> because I refused to vote for either of the two Republican candidates, either <laughs> Romney or Obama. <laughs> I wouldn't support those policies when, when Republicans started advocating them, and now the Democrats are advocating them too, I won't support them either. But Obama is, comp compared with Nixon, Obama is right wing. Even compared with Reagan in some ways, he was right, he's right wing. That's too much for me. I've, I've got to vote for somebody who I can, who I won't be totally ashamed to have voted for. Let's show two evils, who is it? Nah. nah. If you do that, it keeps getting more and more evil. <laughs> uh, as, as long as Democrats figure that people will vote for these right-wing policies that they don't support, just because the other choice seems to be somebody even worse, they'll keep getting worse. It's no accident that the Democrats are getting more and more right-wing, that they're more right-wing now than, Repu than Reagan and, and uh, King George I. Uh, um, I don't, I mean, I admire WikiLeaks, but I think the term free information is simplistic. Uh, I don't think that everybody's personal information should get published. More talking about like government. Well, right. The point is, but that means that we should we should state it in a more specific way because if you advocate free information, it sounds like you're saying everybody's personal information should get published, and I don't believe our personal information should even get collected. I don't have a mobile phone because they're because of the tracking that they do. Or like information that um, affects the public. Oh, well, that's different. But let's, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we need to uh, reduce government's secrecy. Uh, but I'd rather not use the term free information because that that suggests a facile analogy with free software, and these issues are not similar. And the, it's not only that the, 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 con, my, the conclusions are not similar, it's that the, the arguments are not similar. They just have nothing in common. They're totally different issues. What about software patents? Oh, I don't like to talk about patents in a, in a speech about copyright because patents and copyright have nothing to do with each other and nothing in common. But many people think that they do. And the reason that people think so is the misleading term, quote, intellectual property, unquote. You'll notice I didn't use that term. I never use that term. I talk about it with quotes, but I never use the term. And the reason is, Every time someone uses that term, he's talking about a dozen or so unrelated laws that do totally different things, they work in different ways, they have nothing significant in common. So it's a mistake to generalize about them. <coughs> when people do generalize about them, it leads other people to assume that they must be similar. There must be some reason to group them together. It seems implausible, you know, you, people would never guess that it's just an act, a mistake to, gr to group them together. They assume there must be, there must be a good reason. They must really be similar. <coughs> if you go to law school and you study these different laws, you'll see how different they are. So lawyers know that these laws have nothing in common. <clears throat> but most people don't. So to reject the idea that patents have anything to do with copyrights, I prefer not to talk about patents 
in their talk about copyrights. But Wired Magazine published an article of mine uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, recommending how to protect software from patents. You can find other articles in gnu.org slash philosophy about the harm done by software patents or computational idea patents as I prefer to call them because that's, that states more clearly what they are. You mentioned the uh, downloadable book collection. Could you uh, mention that It's again? the Humble eBook Bundle. That's its official name. Uh, yeah, I would. I. I don't think I'm alone in. in I want to. I would like to hear the, any uh, a, a corporate any corporate entity coming with uh, objective and and refined uh, answers to your to your arguments against. Uh, the, the modern copyright uh, status. Uh, have, have you ever shared I'm not going to try to speak for the enemy. No, no, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to ask you to, but I'm, uh, have you ever, or would you be interested in sharing a floor with someone of their spokesman? Probably in a, in a, not. In an and the reason is their position is getting, is in the major media and it's getting spread around and inculcated into people all the time to the point where people, almost everyone, can recite it by heart. You don't need to have one of them in order to make this a debate. What one of them would do, if he's a clever debater, would be to bring up a bunch of red herrings mentioning details that I wouldn't know about, so I wouldn't be able to refute them that day. I'd have to ask someone to look things up. Maybe a week later I'd be able to explain why they're either false or invalid arguments. But at the moment, it would just look like I didn't know what I was talking about. That's what clever debaters do when they're not really interested in truth or justice, but just in winning. There are such people, and I know that they can do that. So I'm not interested in having one of them present in my speeches. Isn't, but isn't that about raising, throwing, throwing up red headings? Isn't that that's also true about uh, theism and, and that? And those I'm, I'm fine. I mean, have a debate if you want, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> the other thing is. If that somebody is famous, he won't agree. If he's not famous, then it would mean that my name is bringing people to listen to him. Well, I don't want to do that. That's helping the enemy. I don't consider this, uh, th this is not like a sporting event. This is war. They started the war, and we're fighting to defend ourselves. Fair enough. Well, uh, as we see, crowdfunding is working better and better. There are free software projects that have got funding that way. Uh, but another thing is that governments fund a lot of software development. And they could just as well take the position that all software they fund will be released as free software unless there's some very special reason why not to release it at all. And uh, you put, there is already a substantial free software business. And there is also a lot of demand in some countries for people to do things other than software development, but that are part of the computing field, like uh, be system administrators. Uh, there is a shortage of GNU slash Linux system administrators in the US. And anybody who's good at that can get a quite high salary. Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to correct you. Uh, you mentioned the European Union copyright record. And we have already implemented it. But, separately, uh, how... 
I'm sad. <laughs> I can't tell you that. I mean, I know arguments in favor of it, but how to convince a given government, that's a different question. Why expect me to be an expert on how to convince your government? I'm a foreigner. I don't live here, and I don't know how politics works in Iceland or that much about it, how it works in any country except my own. And of course, in the US, it's hopeless to convince any politicians to go against the will of the corporate empire. Some computer games enforce end user license agreements in order to retain power over users in the purpose of enforcing rules and preventing foul play. But that doesn't work, I'm told. <laughs> I'm told that users find ways to cheat anyway. I know, but uh, these can be much like disclaimers. I'd like to know, is this uh, your idea of quote unquote bad? It's bad, yes. It, it so always why? involves, it involves denying users freedom. The freedom that, they sh that the users of software should always have. And I'm not willing to give up that freedom to use a game for anything else. So if they make these games non-free, uh, I urge you not to use them. Maybe you could play with your friends and then you could trust each other not to cheat. Well, I'm talking more about uh, like MMOs. Yeah, well, maybe instead of uh, playing with strangers, you would play with some people you know, and then you won't cheat each other. Um, and, and this 10 year rule, uh, what is, uh, if for example, I write a book about an ongoing topic and at some point I publish it, but uh, I still work on my book and uh, want to republish it. Each version edition. would have a 10 year copyright. So, um, uh, after the 10 years, someone else can take my first book and, yes, uh, and republish it with uh, his new uh, yes. things. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you talk a bit about wanting to have a button to make a anonymous... I can't hear you at all. Sorry. You spoke a bit about wanting to have a button to make the anonymous payments. A button? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you see any viable solution for anonymous payments on the internet? On well... The Depends what you mean by viable. <laughs> technical methods to do this are known. It's, this is not a technical problem, it's a social organization problem. Well, Steam is mostly distributing non-free games, so... That's not something that's good. <laughs> well, then the games that are free are ethical and the games that are non-free are not ethical. And what about uh, ads in free software? Well, I'm not against ads as such. <laughs> However, if a program is free, the users could decide to use a version which didn't show the ads. But maybe they wouldn't. Okay? I'm not against ads as such. Uh, today, ads on the internet generally are associated with surveillance. I'm against the surveillance. That I fight against. Uh, if the purpose of the surveillance is to because they want to show me different ads. Well, I have nothing against showing me different ads, but I am against the surveillance. I think it's time to stop, because it's been over two hours. OK, I'll take that one, one more question. I was just uh, wondering, uh, do we have any chance of winning this war? I don't know. Isn't the majority of the population just too spoiled 
to boycott? I don't know. But as I see it, if some of us manage to free ourselves, that's already a victory, even though it's not complete victory. Yes, the goal is the liberation of all of cyberspace, but if we manage to win some freedom for ourselves, that's worth doing. Thank you.